Father Lord, we thank you once again. We exalt and honor you for the privilege we have today to stand once more in your presence, to acknowledge your love, to write your inspiration in our hearts, to teach us the path of wisdom, to learn the path that you, the Lord alone, has shown us. What shall we say, therefore? If God be for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his only son, but we know through him he will give us all things, including all the benefit of life. O oh Lord, we thank you who has endured such contradiction for sin against yourself. Lord, we will not be weary. We will not faint when we are brought to trial. We will glorify your name this morning. We stand in our way of your presence. We thank you for such a bright day. This is the first day of the week where our Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Lord, today is the day you have made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. Father Lord, I will try our heart to unravel the mystery of prophecy today. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for your spirit. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your counsel. We ask, O Lord, that you should teach us what you want us to learn and grant us understanding because the Bible told me hidden things belongs to my God, but the thing that I reveal belongs to me. Lord, reveal your mystery today that in everything we will have cause to glorify your name, to exalt you in the assembly of the saints, to honor you in the principle of your salvation and your graciousness. As many that will come to you today, Lord, may you draw them in wisdom. May you draw them in knowledge. May you draw them in fear and in the knowledge of the Almighty God. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome again to this Open House Fellowship. Today is Sunday where we gather together to understand Biblical prophecy. Today we have a unique teaching, something most of you have learned. We are not going to go deep dive into prophetic utterances or searching the scripture for prophetic inspiration, but we are going to do something that is unique to today that we have not been doing since we started this understanding prophecy. We are going to understand the character of the person from whom the prophecy came from. So we are going to study this lifestyle of a servant of God who the Bible referred to as a friend of God. Today we are taking a look at the lifestyle of Daniel in our topic, Understanding Daniel Lifestyle. We are going to understand Daniel as a person. Why is it that God speak to him? Why was he distinguished from the rest of his colleague? He was not the only exile from Israel to Babylon. But why was his life solely affected and being used of God to perfect and to shape generations to come? How come throughout his life he rose consistently in all the kingdoms? Why was his favor granted that even an enemy kingdom, he still rise to power. That is the reason why we're going to study Daniel. And we pray to God Almighty that He grant you understanding and wisdom to be able to understand what we are about to teach and absorb it. We are going to also be looking at character consistency in his life. We're going to check for patterns. Something that today you can apply to your life. To change the dynamics. We're going to spend time teaching about his lifestyle and how we can um, we can copy it and use it for ourselves today. How we can transform his lifestyle into our personal lifestyle. My name is Missionary Collins. In the next one hour, I will be taking you on this open house fellowship. Where you have opportunity to understand, to study for yourself, and to grow with the gospel. God bless you as you listen. Mm -hmm. Brethren, you are welcome again in the name of the Lord. Holy Spirit, teach us your word. Make, give us understanding and insights and knowledge into your word. 
For no man can know the things of God, except the Spirit of God that is in him. Just as no man knows the things of man, except the Spirit of man that is in him. Lord, tonight, help my spirit to bear weakness with the Spirit of God, so that I can understand the things that are freely given me from God. This I ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today our text is taken from the book of Daniel. We are taking our text from the book of Daniel, chapter 1. We will read from verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, the king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and beset it. And he beset Jerusalem. And the Lord came. And the Lord gave Joachim, the king of Judah, into his hand, with the part of the vessel of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shaman, to the house of his God. He brought the vessel into the treasure of the house of his God. In verse 3, the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of the Enoch, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom has no blemish, but well favored, skills in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, such as has the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provisions of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourish them in three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananias, Mishael, and Azariah. Brethren, one key thing to pay attention to today in this teaching. Daniel was not a prophet in the land of Israel before he was deported to captivity in Babylon. In fact, he came from the lineage of king. He was well favored, selected among one of the king's children who has the ability to stand in the king's palace. We know what characteristic of Daniel. One, he was blameless. He was without sports. There was no physical deficiency in him. He was well nurtured and well favored as a son of a king. That is the quality he has that prompted him to be chosen among Nebuchadnezzar's requirements. Today, we're going to use this quality to figure out how can somebody that grows in the king's house estrange himself from the king's meat? Something is at war here. David was the first king that was taken from the tribe of Judah. His son Solomon sat on the throne. Solomon rebelled against God. His kingdom was divided. And twelve tribes were separated. Ten tribes were separated from Solomon. His son, Jehovah, ruled over two tribes. Those two tribes remained consistent until the northern kingdom were carried away into Ezra in Samaria, in Assyria. Then, the, the southern kingdom of Israel, which was Jerusalem, the tribe of Benjamin, the Levite, and other, and the multitude of other tribes of Israel, who did not want to worship Jehovah idol, they moved to the south to establish the Satan kingdom. 
But this Saturn kingdom, which headquarters was at Jerusalem, stood firm and prospered. That's what the, the Samaria were carried into Ezra. Most of them mis enter into marriages with people from other nations. That's why they were called the Miss Multitude. In Jesus' time, they were called the Samaritans. That's why the children of Israel did not want to have anything to do with them because they become polluted. Because God warned the children of Israel when they leave Egypt not to enter into marriages with people from other tribes. Though these were Israelites, but they were mixed up with the Indomel, the mixed multitude. So to bring them up in terrain which was called the Samaria. But the ten tribes were not lost, but their geographical land were lost. The ten tribes were mixed with the rest of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So, like Peter clearly declared that he was from the tribe of Asher. Where is Asher? Asher is way in the south. So the fact is that he was far in the north, but he was present at Jerusalem. So these kingdoms, they were intermarrying, they indulged among themselves, and the kingdom was never, the people were never lost, nor were the people of those kingdoms lost. As far as God is concerned, whether there was two tribes left in Israel, it was a mystery of the entire tribe of Israel. No tribe of Israel or Jacob was lost. All the ten tribes, twelve tribes, were still complete. And at the end, in the book of Revelation, when God was calling, he did not call two tribes, he called twelve tribes. Because the twelve tribes are still complete tomorrow. So that is one mistake. Many Christians make the calling the ten lost tribes. No tribe was lost. All the tribes were consistent. But their geographical region was taken from the tribe of, of David and given to Rehoboam. To Jeroboam. Jeroboam, whose hands were constantly with Jeroboam, did not want the Sakar kingdom to come to the north to worship so that they would not have conflict, so that their loyalty would not go back to the house of, Jeroboam, of David. So he decided to make two golden calf. He put one in Dan, and he, which is way in the south, and he put one in Ephraim which blankets the two southern kingdoms. But the northern kingdom worship in Jerusalem. So when God promised them that idolatry will be blotted up, that's why the name of Dan and that of Ephraim did not show up in the protected class in the book of Revelation. Because God said idolatry will be blotted out. So this mystery that we understand from these particular kingdoms of Israel, we give us a basis to understand why Daniel, who was of the tribe of Judah, of the house of the princes, because not only the northern kingdom rebelled against God, the southern kingdom also rebelled. In fact, when Hosea was king, God promised him that of his son that would sit upon the throne, they would be carried in exile away to Babylon. When he shows the Babylonian what the, his everything that was in his house, then the prophets sent to him and asked, What did you show him? He said, He has seen everything. He said, Everything he sees will be carried away to Babylon. This prophecy came to pass just as the prophet predicted. And that was exactly why all those things were carried away, including his source. And this is the fulfillment of those prophecies. But first and foremost, what leads to this prophecy being fulfilled in the life of the children of Israel? Did God just wake up and want to punish Israel for their sin? No. The children of Israel have been offending God for 490 years. For 490 years, they did not obey the sacrifice of the Lamb. That six years you shall farm, on the seven years you shall let it rest. The children of Israel violated this rule. God even sent to them in the book of Isaiah to let their slave go. 
to serve them for six years. On the seventh year, they should let go, which is the year of Jubilee. But the children of Israel, they let the slave go according to the word of the Lord. But only to turn when the years of Jubilee was over to capture the slave back and put them into captivity. And the Lord said unto them, Because you have done this, I will send you into captivity beyond Babylon for 70 years. 70 years was determined concerning the children of Israel to stay in captivity. And these 70 years was not in start. It was not in allegorical. It was seven weeks, seven years, according to God's Canada. Seven weeks of years. Because when God talks of seven weeks of years, it's 70 times 7, which is 49. And this figure of speech also appeared when Peter asked Jesus, How many times will my brother offend me? And I will forgive him. Is this seven times? Jesus said, Did I say to you seven times? Nay, 70 times seven. 70 times 7, which is 490 years. That is the number of years God forgave Israel. And that was exactly the number of years God forgave them. God said, because you offended me for 490 years, I will send you into Babylon for 70. You hold me 70 years. And that 70 years became their exiled year in Babylon. Daniel was not deported to Babylon because of his sin. You remember what God says to Moses. He said, I am the Lord thy God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the sons, unto the fifth, sixth, and seventh generation. The sin that Daniel's generation was being punished for was not the sin that was committed in Daniel's time. It was sin committed by Rehoboam. Jeremiah's, Prophet Jeremiah spent many years and months prophesying to them to yield to God's profession so that the city would not be destroyed. It was not the plan of God to destroy Jerusalem and burn it with fire and level the temple when they were going into captivity. The stubbornness of the children of Israel brought about the destruction of the city. Because they would not happen unto Jeremiah the prophet, which was in another thought, which God speaks to and asks to prophesy to the children of Israel. But because they would not listen, the city was leveled, the benefit of disobedience. And the king's eyes was taken out because he broke the truce of the agreement he had with the king of Babylon, thinking that. Because he has gathered some forces that God will be on his side to fight against an enemy nation. After all, Hosea said, How can the Lord give a nation to a nation that is more righteous than? Babylon was a sinful nation, and Jerusalem was more holy than Babylon. But when God punished you, he handed you over to your enemy. And God delivered them to a man that will show them no mercy. When, because when Nebuchadnezzar first beset Jerusalem, he beset it for some time, and he heard his father was dead, Nebuchadnezzar, and he went back to Babylon to take over the kingdom. But when he went to Babylon to take over his kingdom, he left some men in charge of the city. So the siege was loose, and therefore the children of Israel traveled to our flow, and they were not even ready. To take the city. So because of that, Jeremiah's prophecy did not make sense to them. That this man was not going to take the city. It's not serious. Maybe we can fight him. Maybe he's afraid of us. And they took light to the words of Jeremiah. But when he returned, he entered the city. He dismantled everything that was in the city and take the people away into Babylon. But the first group of people he take away as Ezra was the king. He has not destroyed Jerusalem yet. But he take Daniel and his three friends. He took the king of Babylon, of Jerusalem, remove his eyes and take him to Babylon as his slave. So, 
That is the first chapter. Now, let's come to our lesson for today. Now we have the foundation of what happened. Why did God choose Nebuchadnezzar? Strange. Nebuchadnezzar was neither a Christian, nor was he a Jewish man, nor was he a servant of the Lord in any way. In fact, he worshipped idol. But God chose him as an agent of wrath to punish the people of Israel for their sin. That's telling you, telling you something today. That the devil is very wicked, but he does the will of God. God raised him up as an agent of wrath to prove to men what disobedience can lead to. And God does something in which he pleases him so that no man can question his knowledge and integrity. Even the prophet was angry. It's just that when Jonah was sent to Nineveh to preach, Jonah refused to preach in Nineveh. Not because he didn't pity the people. Not because he had no compassion. But because Nineveh was an enemy nation. He knew what the Assyrian Empire did to the children of Israel. They made sure that the children of Israel suffered. And they married them off into a different nation. So that their children can be scattered. And the tribe of Israel will not be formed anymore. So we can be a day to them. Now God told Jonah that he wants to destroy it. In fact, everybody will be happy that your enemy is going to die. But that was not what God wants. God wants his prophet to be indiscriminate, to obey the voice of the Lord, and to cry against Nineveh, that great city. But unfortunately, Jonah was not pleased with that. Jonah didn't want God to save Nineveh. In fact, he wanted God to be quick in destroying Nineveh. And he said, well, God said in 40 days he's going to destroy Nineveh. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah. So, if God is going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days, I better flee to Tarshish. Stay there for 40 days. Before the end of 40 days, I will hear on the telephone that Nineveh is destroyed and is laid waste. And in fact, if I have not done anything, I will have done something for my people Israel. That these people will no longer trouble Israel anymore because they will be destroyed by God. But God understood the thoughts of the prophets. But that was not his plan. That's why the Bible says, thus says the Lord, I know the thoughts I have towards you. They are thoughts of good, not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. You cannot help God. A lot of Christians and prophets who try to help God, they suffer long. Jonah wanted to help God achieve his goal. But what did he do? He flew to Tarshish. And did he get to Tarshish? No. God swallowed him on the way and bring him back to Nineveh. The preaching he didn't want to preach, he preached by fire, by force. Though he preached in anger, but he preached the message. And the message of Jonah saved everybody in the city, including child. And Jonah was so angry that he pleaded that God should take away his life because he saved Israel's enemy, which he didn't want to do. But God said to him, do you do well to be angry? Jonah said, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said to him, you pity a tree that grew up in one night. And the next, floor, the next morning he dies. You did not labor, you did not make it grow. How much more this great city? They have 40,000 people in it. Should I not pity me neither? God is still asking you the same question today. You that want your enemy to die because he has afflicted you for so long. You want them to perish because they attack your children and your marriages. But you pity little dog that you did not do anything to bring forth. Just because he stayed with you at home, you feed him with your food. He does not labor for you. He does not do anything for you. If you show mercy to the life of a dog, should you not show mercy 
to a man who has who is lost, who has a short time, and when he's carried away, he goes into darkness. He doesn't know what is coming after him. Should not you have pity him? The Lord is saying the same thing to you here. As we understand from the book of Daniel, chapter 1, God has made it clear to Daniel that in the first years of the reign of Joachim, the king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and beset it. And the Lord gave Joachim, the king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessel of the house of God. And the Lord gave Joachim, the king of Judah, into his hand. Who gave Joachim? The Lord. Because the Lord said in the book of Isaiah, I have given all things unto Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Strange enough, when did Nebuchadnezzar become the servant of the Lord? Nebuchadnezzar was an idol worshiper, a chronic idol worshiper. In fact, he made a golden image and forced the children of God to worship it. And anybody that will not worship it should be thrown into the fire. Let him see the God that will deliver them out of his hand. But here is God calling him his servant. Servant. That is why the Lord said his ways are past finding out. The ways of God indeed is past finding out. Nebuchadnezzar was an idol himself. He wanted people to worship him. But yet, even to the extent he stood up on top of the tower of his temple, he said, Is it not this great Babylon? He did not give glory to God, not one day. He said, This is not this great Babylon that I give by the strength of my majesty and by the power of my excellency. Just imagine that. That was the day the spirit departed from him. He ate grass like an house. Because God wants to prove to him that he is the one that rules the kingdom of men and give it to whosoever he chooses. And today, you may be in a place of authority. You think it's by your knowledge, your excellence, your competence that places you there. But God is saying, I should tell you this afternoon, people don't get rich because they labor. People don't get promoted because of opportunity. Promotion does not, in fact, does not come from the West. It does not come from the East. It comes from the Lord himself. The Lord is the one that raised up one and pulled down the other. The Lord is the one that lifts up one and bring the other down to the ground. And when you are rich and you increase in goods, Rejoice, but do not set your mind upon it. And when you are brought low, do not weep. Because goats and silvers, they are more eaten and they will perish and they will vanish away. But they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. Nebuchadnezzar was a man who gave glory to himself. He wanted to start his kingdom. He didn't do it the way his father did it. His father has magicians. His father has astrologers. His father has champions who were in charge of the administration. But Nebuchadnezzar woke up one morning. He decided to start his ministry by bringing a foreign slave and training them to stand as princes. And he was ruthless, pretty ruthless. People understand that he's the one that make. Houses in Donkey. He built, he destroyed the house of these people he kills and made them a Donkey. That is who he is. He was ruthless. He was a ruthless kind of leader. But despite his ruthlessness, Daniel finds his way to stand firm on the path of righteousness. Justice, equity, and faith in God. Strange. Today we have a lot of ministers who are Christians. They are very good Christians before they became ministers. The day we promote them from Christianity to government office, that is the same day they take their Bible and they leave it in the church and they go to state house with exercise book. They don't remember the God that take them from the ground to the throne. And when you tell them about their Christian principle, they tell you, you don't understand. They will not listen to me. 
Nebuchadnezzar was a man who was an idol, chronic idol worshiper. But he listened to Daniel. That's why the Bible says in the days of the Spirit of the Lord, the people will be willing. If the Spirit of the Holy God is informed in you, indeed, as it was formed in Daniel, people will listen to you no matter what you have to say. People listen to harsh teaching. People listen to sound doctrine. If the Spirit of the Lord is in you to confirm this word, people will listen. Because there will be power of God to compel them to listen. But when there is no power of God in you, you cannot compel the people to listen to you because your message makes no sense to them. That's why the Bible says, when the Spirit of the Lord comes, the people who are not willing before they become willing. That is it. That is the strength of a believer. That is the quality of a Christian. That is the characteristic of those whom the Lord chose. So today is the day of the Spirit of the Lord Himself. So God can make people willing to hear, willing to understand, willing to give glory to His name. God can give people the grace they need. To be able to hear what they want to hear. So this is the days of God's divine knowledge. The days of God's divine spirit. Willingness comes to mind. Daniel was deported as a teenager to Babylon. To become servants in the king house. But he came with his godly principles. I love the song, said by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, there we wept. How can we sing the lost song in a strange land? But Daniel sang the lost song in a strange land. Daniel lifted up the praise of God in captivity. And the Lord glorified him in captivity. Brethren, Today is a day you need to have that wisdom for yourself. That the lost song can be sung in captivity. When you sing the lost song in captivity, the Lord will rescue you from captivity. But if you sing the lost song in a strange land, the Lord will bring his glory down. That was what he did in the life of Daniel. Daniel remembered Jerusalem. He remembers the wars and the ethics. He remembers the times of obligation. That's why the temples were erased to the ground. He remembers that promotion does not come from the east. It does not come from the west. It comes from the Lord. He understood that what God cannot do does not exist. He understands that wisdom is not God's by knowledge or by skills or by understanding. That wisdom comes from God. And in fact, the fear of God was the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Most High God gives understanding. Daniel understood this. No one by the book of Proverbs says, In order to get him, get wisdom. In order to get him, get understanding. It was like his life. Is something that was studying. And that's why today we are going to take a look at the life of Daniel to see what God did in his life that makes his life worth studying. What makes Daniel unique? That's what our next part of this topic is. What makes him unique? What made people want Daniel to be their mentor? In Christianity today. In Isaiah chapter 2, 8, verse 2, let's go to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah is before the book of Daniel. 
Azra Chapatu. The book of Ezra. Ezra is after Chronicle, after Second Chronicle, you have Ezra. So Ezra chapter 8 from verse 2. He said, Of the source of Phinehas, Jehu, and of the source of Teman, Daniel, of the source of David, Hatush. Hashra gave us the background of Daniel. Daniel was one of the sons of David. He comes from the lineage of Phinehas. He comes from the lineage of Tamar and David, and of the sons of David and Hattush. So that was where Daniel came from. Daniel was clearly from the tribe of Judah. He was of the sons of David. In Nehemiah, Chapter 6, verse, chapter 10, verse 6. Nehemiah, chapter 10, verse 6. Nehemiah 10, verse 6. He said, Daniel, Jeneton, and Berosh. Daniel, Benetosh, and Jerosh. And when you go down the list to verse 10, chapter to verse 9, he says, And the Levites, both Joshua the son of Azariah, Benoah the son of Henadad, and Kamir, and their brethren, Shishon and Kudera. So this gave you the genealogy of people that were deported to Babylon. And the rest of the people, the priest, the levite, the porter, the singer, Nentimi, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the land, unto the laws of God, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge of and having understanding in verse 28. And they that cleft to their brethren and their noble. And enter into a course and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of the Lord, and to observe and to do all the commandment of God and his judgment and his status. Do you understand what they hear? Daniel and this priest, they make a vow to God. Not a vow we will bring car to the house of God. Not a vow we will bring offering and money and silver and gold. But a vow to obey the voice of the Lord. To hearken to his doctrine, to his teaching, to his commandment. To do all that the laws of God has commanded. He was first and foremost holy. He was one of the men which no iniquity was written of in the scripture. I didn't mean to say to you he was sinless, but he was blameless before God. He means in no sense he was found in the sand. Before God, he has done no wrong. That is the man, Daniel. That is the quality we as Christians should strive for in the life of a believer. One of the first quality of Daniel was righteousness. Righteousness. In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. Ezekiel 14, 14. Ezekiel 14, 14. What did he say? Through these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver their own souls from by their righteousness, says the Lord God. You see what we're talking about? Righteousness was his mantle. The garment of righteousness was his cloth, was his garment. No wonder he was not afraid of the, of the king's mandate to be thrown into the lion den. The reason is because the Bible says the righteousness is as bold as a lion. 
The righteous is as bold as a lion. But what's happened to the sinner? But the wicked flew while no man pursues him. Why is the wicked running? No man. But he is running because he is wicked. Those three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, they did something extraordinary. They should deliver their souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. By their righteousness. In 14 verse 20, Ezekiel 14 verse 20, what did he say? Through Noah, Daniel, and Job, they say three men again. We are in it. As I live, says the Lord, they shall deliver their souls, their son. They shall deliver neither sons nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. So the righteousness of a gospel preacher does not equate for his sons. The righteousness of a believer cannot save his wife. He cannot save his children. He cannot even save his daughter. He cannot save them because of his own righteousness. But his own soul will he deliver by his righteousness. I remember a mission when you gather people together and say, Come, let's take the word of God. They say, How much will you give me? And the first question you should have asked the same person is, how much am I being paid to that? How much am I going to pay you to give your life so that we can take it? How much is your life worth these days? How much money will somebody give you for you to willingly give your life? If we go into the ministry or the mission because somebody gives us money to preach, that means our life is worth silver and gold. Because you have your reward on earth. But when we preach the word of God, we make it free of charge so that we can benefit the more. Because our life is worth more than silver and gold. And so are the life that God sent us to save. In the same Ezekiel, let's go to chapter 28, verse 28, 28 from verse 3, it says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Who was he speaking to here? Then Lucifer, you are sent to contend with. Why do you need wisdom? Because the devil is wise. Look at what he says in verse 2. He says, O son of man, say thou unto the prince of Parosh, thus says the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, thou hast said, I am a God, and I sit in the seat of a God, in the midst of the sea, yet thou art not, thou art a man. And not a God. Wherefore, though thou set thine heart as the heart of a God, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret they can hide from thee. With wisdom, with thy wisdom and thy understanding, thou hast gotten riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasure. And by thy great wisdom, and by the traffic, thou hast increased thy riches, and thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because thou hast set thy heart as the heart of a God, behold, wherefore I will bring stranger upon thee, and the terrible of a nation, and they shall bring their sword against the beauty of thy wisdom. And they shall defy thy brightness. And they shall bring thee down to the pit. And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. Will you still say before the man that slain him that you are a God? 
No. You shall be nothing but a man to him. The Lord is saying to you here in this essence, Lucifer, who was the son of the morning, whose brightness was as among the fairest stars of heaven, he was one of those who sat among the stars of God, who was clothed in glory and wisdom. But God says to him, though his wisdom was greater than that of Daniel, who is Daniel? Why is wisdom as counted to him? I thought Solomon was the wisest known man in the Old Testament. But Daniel was wiser than Solomon. Solomon was wise and has understanding. But he felt because he did not rely on his wisdom. He relied on his sight. He felt the word. But that is true wisdom has an understanding endured till he was given the revelation of God. Daniel was wise. He was full of knowledge and understanding. He was full with skills and an excellent spirit was found in him. Even his enemy testified that the spirit of excellence was found in this Daniel because he sold his souls to righteousness. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret they can hide from thee. Daniel was able to tell the king's dream. And Lucifer can know what you think about even before you ask through his crafts and his pretentious demons. They can know what you think about. So there is no secret. So I pity Christians who are trying to hide secrets away from the devil because he knows before you think about it. Thou, Daniel, Job, and Noah, we are in it. As I live, says the Lord, they shall deliver neither son nor daughters by their own righteousness, but they shall deliver their own soul. Your only your soul can you deliver by your righteousness. Your righteousness is not going to stand in for any man. The name given to Bethesda, to Daniel, was Bethesda. Let's check the Bible in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 7, to understand why he was called Bethesda. Unto whom the prince of the Enoch gave the names, for he gave to Daniel the name Bethesda, who is like Bel. That was his name. Who is like Bel. But the name Daniel stands for who is like Jehovah, who is like God. But they call Daniel who is like their God. But the Shazer was given the name Daniel shall call Daniel. Photo changes of Daniel innocency. Daniel innocency. In the book of Chronicle, First Chronicle chapter 3, from verse 1. First Chronicle chapter 3, from verse 1. He said, Now these were the sons of David that were born unto him in Hebrew. The first one was Ammon, and of Ahinoah the Jezreelite. The second was Abigail the Canaanite. And the third was Absalom of Maka, and the daughter of Tamar, the king of Jehovah. And the fourth was Adonijah, the son of Haggat. Now, we understood that those children was born unto David. But Daniel, in no sense, he was formed in him. Daniel, in no sense, 
was formed in him. Now let's confirm what happened in the book of Daniel. Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself by eating food that was sacrificed to idol. There was no pastors anymore to direct Daniel. There was no prophet to tell him what is wrong and what is right. But Daniel in his heart proposed that he would not defile himself by eating food sacrificed to idol. He separated himself. He did not only separate himself, he separated his three friends with himself. He was not only a Christian, but he affects. He was a great missionary. He made a transformation of his friend. He did not stand for God alone and says, I died in my innocence. But he took other people to God. He took his three friends with him and they said, we will not eat. Nebuchadnezzar, we told you how fearful he was. He made the family. He destroyed not only the person, but the family and made their hearts a done deal. That was the person Daniel was ready to disobey. To keep the commandment of the Lord. And the priest of Enoch said to Daniel, I am afraid. Let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 1, and read. So you understand what we're talking about here. Daniel 1, verse 8. Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defy himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Wherefore he requested of the prince of the Enoch that he might not defy himself. Now, God has brought Daniel in favor and tender love in the, with the prince of the Enochs. Because when you set your mind to obey God, God will grant you favor in the sight of man. And the prince of the Enoch said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your meat and your drink. Why should he seize your face worse, lacking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall he make me endangers my head to the king. The Enoch was not wanting to disobey Daniel because of disobedience sake. But he fears the king because he knew what the king can do to him and his family. If Daniel's face does not look as bright as the rest of the Enoch. Then said Daniel to Misa, whom was the priest of the Enoch, I have set over Daniel and Ananias, Zarias, Mishael and Azariah. Prove thy servant. Faith tells you to tell the enemy, prove me. Prove. God did not say test me. God said prove me. Prove God. Somebody tells you, sorry, I cannot listen to you because of what will happen. Tell the person to prove God. Daniel said, Prove thy servant. I beseech thee ten days. Just ten days. We are not waiting for a whole month. Ten days. And let them give us pots to eat and water to drink. Then let your countenance, let our countenance be looked upon before thee. And the countenance of the children of them that eat the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest, deal with thy servant. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer, fatter in flesh than that of all the children that did eat the portion of the king's meat. Strange enough, they were brighter, they were fairer, their countenance and their fatness was more than that of those that ate beautiful food, pig, guinea fowl that the king ate. 
What? That is because they prove God. Daniel, apart from his innocency, he was committed to faith. He was committed to God's will in his life. He was ready to take extra minds to obey God. That he would not defy himself. Misa, the steward, whom the priests of the Eno set over Daniel and the Tiri Hebrew men. Daniel 1, verse 11 to 16. After Misa took away the portion of their meats and the wine that they should drink and gave them pause, because he had seen evidence. People are not going to obey God by force because you said so. They are going to obey God because they see God in action. You're going to prove that. Come and see what the Lord has done. I remember when we went to Hotel. We had a conference and the king put a meeting from 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock in the night. I did not bother. And at the end of the teaching, I pick up a mark. I said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good tidings to the neck. To proclaim liberty to the captive. And when the people in the meeting begin to see the captive being set free, they left the king in the meeting. They come to the conference. Because in the days of the power of the Lord, the people will be willing. This Enoch was not ready to listen to Daniel because Daniel was Daniel. Or because he was a friend. Or because he found favor with God. No. He was ready to listen to Daniel because he proved it. Proof, your God. You are an ambassador. Ambassador is not listening to because he he tells stories about his country. He is listening to because he represents his country. He is able to bring the mandates of the president to bear in a foreign land. That is the reason why he is an ambassador. Why people respect him. So people will not respect you if you are an ambassador of heaven. If God is not present in you. People will only respect you if you are a bastard that carry God with you. When you are going anywhere, you take God for home. And when you get there, you show them the God you bring for home. You don't wait there to look for God. Like an evil man that said, I was looking for God. I went into the rubber plantation, I was searching for God. I climbed on top of the Hiroko tree, I was searching for God. I said, when I see God, I will change his name, I will name him Chineke. But unfortunately, God was not in the tree. God was not in the river. God was not in the ocean. Neither was he on top of the tree. But God he was looking for was near him. He was in his mouth. The word of faith, which you should speak. The Bible said, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it will come to pass, and light will shine upon your words. Daniel did not need to pray first to ask the servant to prove him. He knew that as a servant of the Lord, when he speak, God will honor his word. If you indeed believe that God has called you, when you speak the word, the Lord will put light in your words. Christians don't fast and pray before they, tell, before they prove themselves before the unbeliever. Christians think fast in their liberty that God has made them free. Ministers and civil. In the book of Daniel chapter 2, from verse 48, let's read Daniel 2, 48. Daniel 2, 48. He said, and the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him rulers over the whole province of Babylon. The chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Was Daniel wise? Yes. But was he among the magicians? No. Was he an astrologer? No. Was he? But he was in charge of them all. <laughs> but what brought about this? In verse 48, before we go to 48, let's read verse 46 and 47. To so see why the king made Daniel. Let's start from 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain 
without hands and breaks in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, and the great God has made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof what sure. Mystery. The king has a dream. And the dream no magician was able to tell. Because the king did not remember the dream. And the king said, anybody that will remember me the dream that I did not remember and tell the interpretation, I will make him a great man. But if you will not, I will take your head from you. Daniel did not want to be killed with the magician. Not that Daniel was seeking for glory. Daniel did not want to be killed with the rest of the magicians. And the astrologer, because he has his work definition fits the same profile, he decided to suck the face of God. And God revealed the mysteries to him. He come before the king and tell the king what his dream was and the interpretation thereof. Because there is a God in heaven who revealed the mystery. There is a God whose dwelling is not with men. Who can tell you what you dream yesterday night? There is a God whose dwellings are not with the princes of the people, but he can tell you the vision you have while you were still on your night's bed. And that is the same God Daniel wanted. And that the God was able to tell Daniel what the king dreamt. And give Daniel also the king's interpretation. And something went false. And Daniel and then King Nebuchadnezzar, when he heard all this, fell on his face. He was a king. And worshipped Daniel. And commanded that they should offer obligation or sweet order unto him. Because it was more than what his God could do. <laughs> when men sees that you are more than what their God is, they worship you as they worship God. Because the God the king trusts were the God of the magician, the God of the astrologer, the God of the sign readers. But those God failed him. But they saw in Daniel an excellent spirit. And the king answered and said unto Daniel, and said of the truth, it is your God that is the God of gods. It is your God that is the God of gods. People will not believe and said the sea signs. It is your God that is the God of God and the Lord of kings, the revealers of secrets. See thou who has revealed these secrets. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him rulers over the whole province of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. So, remember what we said at the beginning of our lesson. Promotion does not come from the East. It does not come from the West. But it comes from the Lord. The Lord is the one that raises up one and casts down the other. The Lord is the one that lifts men up and breaks them down to the ground. Prosperity. Daniel's prosperity increased in the land. It increased in the land. Today, we study it because Christians should understand the events that bring results. Today, I will not be able to refer you, but I will only just read through some of the things you need to understand. Like Daniel's 70 weeks of years was found in Daniel chapter 27 verse 25 12 verse 7 the wisdom of Daniel Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 and 14 and 5 verse 14 Daniel wisdom was on match Abstemiousness, abstain, abstainers of Daniel from all idols and evil sacrifice and worship. Daniel 1 verse 8 to 16. Abstainers, total abstainers of Daniel from all evil. Daniel 1 verse 8. 
And angels, the Spirit of the Lord, appearance to Daniel. Daniel in the lion den. All this you can find it in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, from 20, verse 22. Daniel 8, 16, 9, 21. Daniel 10, verse 5 to 10. Daniel 16. Daniel 10, verse 5 to 10. Verse 16, 18. Then 12, verse 5 to 7. Blessing, temporal from God, exemplifies to Daniel. Daniel 1, verse 9. Conscience. He was formed with the conscience that yes, God. Faithfulness. Daniel was profoundly faithful to God in all his doing. He refused to eat the king's means of wine and drinks. Daniel overcame conspiracy with faith, not with cowardice. He heard that they were going to take his life. If he prayed to God, he did not quit prayer and say, I'm a holiday for today. God, you know, I always pray to you before, but now they want my life. God, I am on holiday. When you have saved me from this enemy, I will return to prayer. No. Daniel knew. He did not close his window. If he has closed it before, now he opened it. And he bowed his knee three times a day to pray to the same God. When the enemy says, do not serve God in this country, remember what they said to Jeremiah. If you want to prophesy, go to Anakos, your village, and prophesy. But for Jerusalem, is the king cost. Do not prophesy here. That is exactly what the enemy will tell you. They're going to chase you from the mission field. They're going to say to you, this place is not, you don't have permits to preach the gospel. But I tell you, people that want to do all kind of festival and sing does not need permits. Now you need permits to preach the gospel. You don't need permit for the word of God. You don't need permits to declare the truth. Daniel stood with conscience, faithfulness. He refused to be compromised. Daniel overcomes conspiracies and instances of evil conspiracies. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 4 to 17, conviction. He was not afraid. For instance, Darius, when Daniel was in the lion den, did not sleep. It was only Daniel that wasn't able to sleep. But the man who threw him into the den did not sleep. Because sleep vanished from his eyes. Courage. Be steadfast. Courage in the face of adversity. Daniel remained faithful. Courageous. When he faced trouble. The courage of conviction. Daniel in persistence in prayer. Regardless of editing against prayer. In the land. Though an edict has been passed. He was courageous. He remained steadfast. He did not look at the ferocity of the teeth of the lion. He did not look at the face of the roar. He did not look with fear and contentment. But his remest efforts. Look upon God, not your fears. Look upon the face of heaven, not the face of the trouble that disturbs you on death. When your trouble gets bigger, look at God's greatness. When your trial gets voluminous, look at the height and the strength and the breadth of God's creation. You will be surprised of what it can do. Curiosity. Daniel was curious. Because of his curiosity, knowledge was imparted into him. And he endured as to understand the book of Revelation because why? Of his curiosity. Of the event. Daniel has a dream. Most of us, when we have dream, we forget the dream. We do not even remember the understanding of the dream. We cannot interpret it. We throw it into the dustbin and we walk away. But that not for Daniel. Daniel was curious enough to fast. 
for interpretation of prayer. Daniel was curious enough to understand prophecy. To the extent he did not only fast, he fasted for a whole two weeks, sometimes three weeks, that he may understand what God has proposed in his heart to do. How many days do you fast for your prophecy? Do you fast to have understanding? Do you fast for wisdom? You wake up in a sleep and you had a dream that troubled you and your mind is troubled because of it. You don't understand it. Do you take the dream to God? Or you say, well, it's just a dream. You walk away. But not for Daniel. Daniel understood the meaning of divinity. He understands that the vine always relates with him through dreams. And he comes to Daniel by night. And when Daniel could not understand it, he cried to God. And when God could not bring the answer to dream, God said an end. It was that serious. That is God. So brethren, God wants us to have the same understanding as Daniel has. To not only be patient and wait for God, but to ask for answers. For things he did not understand. Daniel's curiosity brought him victory. In the instance of Daniel's vision, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, Daniel was strong in diplomacy. In the instance of corrupt practices, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar court to secure the destruction of Daniel. In chapter 6, verse 4 to 15, dream instances of Daniel concerning the four beasts, dreams of instances of Daniel on the priests of Babylon, and Daniel's faith consistent instances of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Daniel's faith was proven even in the lion den in Daniel chapter 6. This is where we end our teaching for today. Brethren, I want you to reflect upon what we learned so far. Take a view of the life of Daniel. Compare it with your own. Ask yourself a question. If I come face to face with fear and death, am I going to deny God? Will I hold on to my integrity? Even if it requires me losing my life in the process? Do you still hold on to your integrity like Job? Like his wife said? Do you still hold on to your integrity? Why not just curse God and die? Are you one of those that are ready to curse God and die because of affliction? Or ready to curse God and give up just because you feel that God is not giving you the answer you desire? Or you are like Daniel, who when he fasted for two weeks, there was no result. He continued for the ten weeks. Are you ready to wait upon the Lord? The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. They mount up with wings like that of an eagle. They soar out of the mountain and they are at rest. Brethren, this is where we end our teaching for today. I want you to take your time to reflect on it. Say, God, I want to be your ambassador like Daniel. I want to represent you as Daniel represents you. I want to represent you before sickness. I want to represent you before the world. I want to represent you before demons. I want to represent you before the dead. I want to represent you in every area I put my footstep. In my ministration, I want to represent you. In my ministry, I want to represent you. Lord, I want others to see Jesus in me. Because by going through this world of sin, my life is a book before their eyes. They are reading me through and through. They ask themselves one single question. Does my life point them to the sky? And that is what God expects from us. Your life should be able to point people to heaven. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You want to follow Christ? Follow my footsteps. Your life should be able to be an example for the world to follow. 
Nebuchadnezzar did not worship Daniel because Daniel was fat. Nebuchadnezzar did not worship Daniel because Daniel was fair. He did not worship Daniel because Daniel was taller or Daniel was very strong and he was a warrior. In fact, none of those things were written on Daniel. Daniel was not a warrior, nor was he a battle strength. But Daniel has a unique gift. Ability to wait upon the Lord. Ability to wait upon the Lord. Because the Bible said they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. And because of this, the spirit of holy God was formed in him. And an excellent spirit was added unto him. Better today you can still get an excellent spirit. Let us pray. Father, I release your spirit of excellence. I release your spirit of wisdom. I release your spirit of holiness. I release your spirit of knowledge. I release your spirit of peace. Lord, let it fall upon the church. You say in the days of your power, the people shall be willing. As many that have sold themselves to do what is right, as Daniel and his fellow. Father, Lord, let this authority Follow them that believe. In your name, they will cast out devil. They will heal all manner of disease. They shall lay their hand upon the sick and they will recover. They will take serpents by their hands and nothing shall by any means hurt them. They shall eat poisonous food, drink deadly water. Nothing shall harm them. Because you, the Lord, will go with them and make every cricket will play before you. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you. Brethren, this is where we end our teaching for today. And if you have missed any of our video, you can still go to cgfnslogin.app. cgfnslogin.app. And if you can also give us offering by going to the same web, click on the top that says giving. You can give anything to support this ministry and to help us to advertise so that more people can be rich with the gospel. God bless you as you participate. Amen. We will see you again by Tuesday by 5, Tuesday by 7 p.m. Tuesday by 7 p.m. or for those in Europe by 19 o'clock. And that is the opportunity for us to study together in our Open House Fellowship where we use the opportunity to teach you the foundation and the rudiments of mission and things you need to understand to prepare you for the work of the ministry. It's our discipling class where we use opportunity to equip those who are preparing for mission. God bless you as you participate. Amen.